Good morning. Here we are on KADYTV.com where we're rewriting the rules of local television. We're at the Turning Point Foundation fundraising breakfast this morning with the CEO, Clyde Reynolds. How are you? Very good. Thank you. So you have a great turnout here this morning. What do you hope to accomplish today? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One, we see this as an educational event, as a chance to kind of make the community more aware of mental illness and also the hope of recovery that people here, our speaker and our two speakers are going to be talking about their own personal stories of recovery. It's, uh, and so it's very educational and obviously it's also a fundraising event. So we're hoping that the donations will also be there to help support the organization and the services that we provide. That's great. So how long has Turning Point been here in Ventura County? We've been incorporated since uh, I guess 22 years now. Uh, and uh, had the, I had the good fortune of actually helping to found the organization, so I've been with the organization all of this time. Wow, that's yeah. great. So how many people do you expect here today? About 260 people uh, have signed up to be here today, so that's a good turnout. It's a very good turnout. It's nice to see that many people in the community coming out and having an interest in mental health. And what's the mission of Turning Point Foundation? <clears throat> the mission is to actually to provide uh, shelter, housing, rehabilitation programs and self-help programs to basically support persons who are mentally ill to really reach their highest potential as contributing members of the community. Wow. And where are your offices located? Our main office is in Ventura, our administrative office, and we have programs in Ventura, Oxnard, and Simi Valley and Camarillo. That's great. Yeah. So if you're interested in helping the mental health here in Ventura County, reach out to Turning Point Foundation. Thanks so much for being Thank here, you, Clyde. Man. Thank you for doing this. And we 
we have Superior Court Judge Colleen Toy White. Colleen. Thank you. Glad to see you. Santa Paula City Councilman Fred Robinson. There he is, okay. And one of my favorite people, Ventura County City Councilman Neil Andrews. Where's Neil? It's right here in front of me. Can't miss him. Glad to see you, Neil. Ventura County City Manager Rick Cole. Where's Rick? He didn't manage to get here. Oh, I'm sorry to see that. All right, the Church County Mental Health Board Chair, Irene uh, Millick. Where's Irene? There she is, Irene. And the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, another one of my favorite people. Executive Director Ratan Bhavnani. Where are you, Ratan? I saw you earlier. Oh, right here. Thank you. Let's give these folk a hand. Welcome. kind sacrifice that these folks made to be with us today. Every one of them is very busy. Now we have some event sponsors here, Janssen Pharmaceuticals and the McCarthy Companies. Uh, Pat and Sarah McCarthy, where is Pat and Sarah? Where are they? Oh, Do we have a representative of Janssen Pharmaceuticals? No. Well, we're all here because of them. So. Should you see Jansen anywhere, give them an applaud and a pat on the back. Now, we have some table sponsors here, Old Creek Winery, Republic Services, Cypress Place, Marilyn Scott. Marilyn, I saw you a moment ago, where are you? Marilyn. Over there. Oh, way over there. Okay, Marilyn. And uh, Bob Kingman, Robert England. Where's Robert? No? Okay. Well, they sponsored it anyway. We're glad that you're here. And right now, I'd like to turn our microphone, pulp it over to the executive director, founding executive director for Turning Point Foundation, Mr. Clyde Reynolds. Self-responsible. 
As they continue the recovery, they are able to move on to our supported housing programs. We have students in place in Ventura and uh, Willie House in Austin. And the goal of these programs is to increase those, their independent living skills and to help them maintain their housing. Our newest program, the Adult Wellness and Recovery Center in Austin, becomes a place where they begin to actually reduce their dependence on mental health services and increase their involvement in peer-based support systems to continue the recovery. Here they create a wellness and recovery action plan that helps them manage their symptoms, helps them to expand their support system, to achieve their life goals, and to create a meaningful life for the community. So as you can see, a person may begin their recovery coming off the streets homeless into our shelters, and the hope and the goal is that they will eventually end up in the self-help support system where they can then maintain their recovery and to have that meaningful life in the community. So we're, we're pleased that we're able to now provide that entire range of services to the community. But the best way to demonstrate the role Turning Point plays in a person's recovery is to have someone share their personal recovery story. Today, Daniel Rivera, a current resident at Stevenson Place, who also attends the community center, has agreed to share his story. Please welcome Daniel. I'm 
because they're restless. They're proud of what you've done here. Uh, thank you for that, for sharing that with us. It's interesting, as I was listening to you, Daniel, how interlaced our community has become in terms of services. Hi, Jim. I just found out you Jim Durant here from YMCA. And I should probably mention Rob Wolf over here, too, the head sticking above, above everybody else. Project Understanding, Executive Director. But it's interesting to me how interlaced our community has become because as Daniel went through his story, I've heard agency after agency, church after church that are all working together here. Harvard Community Church in particular, I noticed you mentioned this, has done a fantastic job uh, working with the homeless, <coughs> attempting to move them from homelessness into a more stable environment with at least a roof. Uh, doing an incredible job, Sam Pellucci, the pastor there, and there are many others who are involved in this as well. And as I was listening to Daniel and hear how our community has rallied in so many different ways to make change happen. Our speaker today is an amazing character. I did some research on him prior to this morning. And where is he? He's supposed to be sitting here somewhere. Okay. Oh, you look so much better than your pictures. That's so <laughs> Okay, uh, I, I get it, I get it. Our speaker this morning is Tom Roberts from Huntington Beach. Tom earned his Master of Arts in Radio, Television, and Film from the University of Kansas. And he did postgraduate studies in theater arts at the University of Missouri. Tom is a former broadcast journalist and has contributed reports to the National Public Radio's All Things Considered. How many of you listen to that? I'm one of those. So I know I've heard you. Now, the Voice of America is also spoken there, and ABC Radio News. He is also an actor, a voiceover artist. That's two of us. <laughs> His credits include the role of Oliver Winchester, of Winchester rifle fame in the Sarah Winchester story for the Nippon Television Network in Tokyo. And he was the voice of the all-time great hero, Judas of the great passion play in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. That's quite a span of uh, acting there. <laughs> Tom Roberts was a professional in broadcasting, a professor at broadcasting at John Brown University in Salome Springs, Arkansas. I know that place too. Wow. He's taught technical communication at UC Berkeley School of Engineering Extension. Tom was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 1993. I should introduce you to some of the members of my congregation. Uh, that's the only excuse I can find for some of their activities. Some that's really tragic at times. A graduate of the complete Bipolar Advantage series of workshops, Tom has first-hand experience of what it is like to make profound changes in his life, and he has a gift for helping others with severe mental illness who share the struggle for a better life. The story of his experience inspires both patients and those who love and support them. As a mental health advocate, Tom's website, quick, write this down, tomspeaksout.com, just think of tomspeaksout.com, you'll get it, is dedicated to providing information about the major mental illnesses because he believes knowledge is the best way to combat the stigma. Tom's book, Chewing Through the Straps, Living with Bipolar Disorder, will be coming out later this year, and I intend to buy a copy. I may be the only one, but you'll have at least one sale. In the <laughs> Please, the rest of you take my cue here. Uh, I was reading some pieces about this on the internet, and it looks like it's going to be a fabulous read, so please keep that in mind. Chewing Through the Straps, Living with Bipolar Disorder, and today, he's going to share with us his presentation called 17 Minutes. Please welcome Tom Roberts. is a sliver of time. 
time. In 17 minutes, you can take a shower, or prepare a meal, or watch half of two and a half men. <laughs> I was tempted with Charlie Sheen jokes this morning, though. <laughs> but in the next 17 minutes, someone, somewhere, in the United States will be dead. A victim of suicide, one of the 30,000 suicides we have every year in the United States. It wasn't that long ago that I slipped a plastic bag over my head, fed up with the depression that had sucked all the joy out of my life, but then I thought of something that Ernest Hemingway once said. The reason you do not commit suicide, he said, is because you remember how much, how swell life gets after the hell is over. <laughs> Unfortunately, as some of you may know, Ernest Hemingway did not follow his own advice. <laughs> because in 1966, he put the barrel of a shotgun in his mouth and pulled the trigger with his big toe. I put a face and a name on mental illness as I tell my story to realize that we're talking about a brain disease, not a character defect. Stigma is potentially fatal because people don't seek help when help is available through medication, through counseling. It may be for you an elderly neighbor like Don Cornelius, the soul train founder who shot himself earlier this month. Or a young teenager, 15-year-old Drew Ferraro de la Supercenta, who jumped headfirst off the top of the school two weeks ago, dying in front of his friends. Or it may be a member of your own family. To give you better insight into what happens to someone who is so afraid of acknowledging that they have a problem that it leads them to the point of taking their lives. Jerry was a 35-year-old businessman. His father had given him a, 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 a furniture store to manage, but because his drinking was so heavy and because he took so many pills, he ran the business in, to the ground. Jerry was diagnosed bipolar when he was in the Army, but the armed services said, oh, we're not going to deal with it, they let him go, without the help. And he was too ashamed of the stigma of being called labeled crazy by his parents or by his friends or even by his wife to get help. So he did what a lot of people do. Daniel mentioned that a moment ago. He self-medicated with booze and prescription narcotics, and would disappear for days on end, usually with another woman. His wife knew what he was doing. But one day, one time, one winter, he didn't come back. He had walked into the woods with a bottle of whiskey and a bottle full of prescription drugs and sat down at the foot of a pine tree and drank it all and took all the pills. Two weeks later, a couple of bankers walking by and spotted his body. They had to examine it with dental records in order to know who it was. He'd rather die than to admit that he had a mental illness. Teresa is another one. She started taking pills and when she was a teenager because she was overweight, and so she took diet pills. And the diet pills uh, graduated to, uh, moved on to another kind, other kinds of pills. So by the time she was in her 20s, she was definitely hooked, and she would do anything for a fix, including writing bad checks. And on the third offense, she was convicted and sentenced to five years in prison 
to provide me a new job. Our ex-husbands are gone. When she got out five years later, she decided to keep her life clean, so she went to N.A., Narcotics Anonymous, went to meetings, uh, did everything she was supposed to do. But the depression came back, and she couldn't tell anybody, or she didn't feel like she couldn't tell anybody what was wrong. She would cut herself with scissors, being taken to the hospital, and the emergency room patched her up, let her go. Never referred her to a psychiatrist. I'm not sure she would have gone had, had, had she been able to do that. Seven years after she was released from prison, Teresa took an overdose of prescription narcotics and died on the couch in her apartment. Two examples. Two people. You know their backgrounds. You know the challenges that they have. And yet, they have rather died than ask for help because of stigma. And I do believe there's a direct correlation between the high suicide rate we have in the United States and the stigma that we attach to mental illness. It's time for that to stop. That's why I tell my story. I tell my story because I want to put a face and a name on a mental illness. I had bipolar disorder. And when I was diagnosed in 1993, it came as quite a surprise because I thought I was just uh, depressed. But then when a friend of mine observed that I was acting kind of crazy and scaring other people and I should go see a psychiatrist and find out what's going on. And it wasn't until that point that I sat down in a psychiatrist's office and talked nonstop for an hour. And Dr. Tate stopped it and said, without a doubt, Mr. Roberts, you are manic depressive. And I'm putting you on video. When I tell my story, I tell it in three parts as a play. Well, part one is the diagnosis of the crisis. Part two is the diagnosis. Part three is the recovery. I want to emphasize the recovery part today because that is an integral part of the Turning Point Foundation. It's what you're all here about. Real recovery from an incurable disease. It's not going to go away. We can take medication to help control its symptoms, but we have to live with it. My crisis came, incidentally, the same year that the Turning Point Foundation was organized, 1988. In the spring of 1988, I was busy disorganizing my life. <laughs> I was a college professor, a PhD candidate. I was married to the same woman for 18 years. I had two young children, ages 6 and 10. And I went to a mental hospital because I was depressed. And as I was sitting in the uh, common area where we were having, uh, having playing cards, I think, what we were doing, there was a man who suffered from schizophrenia that they had picked up someplace. And he was non responsive, and he just stared at the wall, whatever he was doing. And suddenly he started laughing. And one of the ladies who was sitting next to me asked him, Hey, Kenny, what's so funny? And he pointed at me and said, he's crazy. <laughs> and you know, that was the best diagnosis I got. <laughs> we're hard to catch. Anyone here with bipolar disorder, you know, we're hard to catch. When we're manic, we don't go to the doctor and say, hey doc, I feel great, what's wrong? <laughs> we present the other side. So we were treated with antidepressants. In the psychiatric hospital, at least my first tour there, they gave me a brand new drug. It came out in 1987. It's called Prozac. And if we have any psychiatrists here, you know that you do not prescribe Prozac to a man with depressant. Well, it sent me to the moon. And in three days, I was ready to do what I'd always wanted to do. 
and that was to go to Hollywood <laughs> and be a professional actor. <laughs> I've been acting for a long time. I've done television commercials and little movie parts here and there. And I thought, hey, I'll do that. So I dropped my family. <laughs> I dropped my college teaching position, broke the contract, and ran off to Hollywood. But I took along with me a, a lady that I had found at the psychiatric hospital. <laughs> As you know from, uh, by now your knowledge of bipolar, that hypersexuality is one of the symptoms. And uh, my, my hypersexuality was so prolific that Dr. Carol Lieberman, uh, the media psychiatrist, wrote about me in her new book, Bad Girls. I covered two chapters, by the way. To get the book, she called me Sean. <laughs> Just to protect the rights of the, uh, of the guilty. In the I wound up in Hollywood during the 1988 writer's strike. <laughs> you remember that? That was the longest strike of the guild. I didn't care. It all made sense to me. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you're manic and you make these kinds of crazy decisions, it all makes sense. Well, I went off to Prozac when I got to LA. Went to the deep, deep, deep depression. <coughs> and then sneaked away in the middle of the night on a bus to go back to Arkansas. My wife wouldn't have me. The marriage was over. The university wouldn't have me back. My job was over. All I had were two little children who loved their dad desperately. And I got my monthly visitation with them for a weekend. I got as close to them as I possibly could. And it was during that time I was also learning about this disease and trying to come to grips with what I needed to do to recover, to make my life better. And that was where I, I found myself just asking a lot of questions. Why am I still, why do I still have mood swings? What's going on here? What can I do to prevent that from happening? Well, what I found out is by coming, is that by coming to meetings put on by organizations like this, that I can learn from my peers, how to manage my illness. The point I want to make to you, you do not suffer from a mental illness. You live with it. I like what Patty Duke says about her bipolar disorder. She wrote a book of brilliant madness. Recovery is an evolution. It is not an overnight experience. It is an evolution. I have revolved in the last 22 years. I, uh, I know that recovery doesn't, it doesn't mean I'm going to be cured. I know it means, doesn't mean I'm going to return to a previous state. But I do know that I can evolve to be the person that I want to be. Daniel talked about his daughter being reunited during my manic time when my daughter wouldn't even invite me to her wedding. But in my recovery, it's a different story. She's given me two beautiful grandchildren. She is a nurse, a registered nurse in the emergency room uh, at the Methodist Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. And she told me recently, Dad, uh, sometimes there's a bipolar person that comes in and got off their medication, things are going nuts. And what I tell them is, hey, my dad has bipolar. He takes his medication. He goes to counseling, and he's just fine. You do the same. So my experience hopefully can help other people in whatever way is possible. And sometimes it's through that broken relationship of a lost daughter. And now 
we're very close. I'm very close to my son as well. It, could, it almost wasn't like that. I couldn't make that decision. Go ahead and kill yourself, Tom. Just get it over with. You've made such a mess out of life. Just get it over with. But I couldn't do it. I knew that if I continued to plod along sometimes, <coughs> make a little progress here and there, help somebody else in some way, find that purpose in my life, and I'm doing what I believe is my life's purpose now, which is to share my story. The Turning Point Foundation is what I call a culture of recovery. It is where individuals matter. No degree of impairment make them matter less. I told you the story of Jerry and Teresa a couple of minutes ago. I wonder if somebody could give me a glass of water down there. I, my mouth has gotten really dry. Thank you so much. There is more to the story that I left out. I always like Paul Harvey to sit down for the rest of the story. <laughs> Jerry was my brother. His um, seventh birthday was the day after our mother died. I was 14. And it was res I was responsible for taking care of him and our baby brother, Randy, who was three. Because our grief-stricken father was often too drunk to be a parent. Our dad remarried two years later and brought into our lives a stepsister. She was Teresa. <coughs> Two suicides, one family, five years apart. Why? Because they were afraid to ask for help because somebody might say they were crazy. My brother could have been a, a grandpa like me right now. His boys are grown. They have had, have had children. He's missing out on so much in life. For those of you who do not have a mental illness, you have a challenge. And that challenge is to do what you can to break down that wall of stigma that is keeping people from getting help. I always like what former President Bill Clinton said after the suicide of his close friend and Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster back in 1993. You may remember that. The President said, there's no shame in mental illness. <clears throat> But stigma and bias should shame us all. And for those of you who have a mental illness, whatever it is, I want to leave you with the words of a poem written by a country lawyer back in 1920. It's called Deserata. Deserata is a Latin term meaning desired thing. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here.
pastors, we talk about 20% uh, of our congregation taking 80% of our time. It's usually the folk that are bipolar dealing with these rises and falls in their, in their struggle with life. Every once in a while I get a text message from one of my young people, youth. He's attending Ventura College now getting a degree, but uh, Pastor, I can't handle it anymore. Life is done. So I get on the phone, we talk, and I tell him this is only temporary. It'll get better in about a day, two days, maybe four. And sure enough, it happens. And I say, see, see, it gets better. Then he's mad for a while, and he's conquering the world. Then I get text messages again. And thank you for your message this morning. It's great to see that it's possible to use all of that as an asset. Thank you very much. and uh, the movie and the roses and the corsage 
and the box of candy. Just like that. We do that. Now, what does that mean? Dollar uh, forty-nine a week, or six dollars and twenty-five cents a month. See, when you look at it in those terms, it's so easy to part with that shekel, that lira, that dollar, and it doesn't hurt. It's painless. But think of the good that comes from it. The transformation of individual lives, human beings, our neighbors, fellow citizens of our community who are struggling with these mental health issues. This allows us to continue the work that we do in this community. So how about it? What can you do? We have, uh, let's see, $250 table, that's $25 a person. So the, 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 we could easily raise much more than uh, $20,000 this morning. Can we do that? Yes. I only heard one yes. That's such a disappointment. <laughs> Thank you. It was over here somewhere. Would you say it again nice and loud, please? Yes. Where was it? Yes. Thank you. That's the one I'm looking for. Can we do this? Yes. What do you say? Ah, now we're cooking. A little, uh, just a few more. I didn't hear any over in this corner over here. <laughs> I heard them here. Can we do this? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. So on your table, we have an envelope. We have a representative of Turning Point at each table. Uh, take the envelopes, pass them around, make sure that everyone has one. We try to make it as easy as possible. First of all, put your name, address, city, so on, because your contribution today is tax deductible. There's no sense sending any more to the government than you actually have to. So you're not required by law to send anything more than what the law requires. So reduce your tax bite by donating this morning. Now you can put, check the amount or the other. Please choose the other and put six figures there. <laughs> if you would like to do this monthly, you can do that. If you'd like us to fill your credit card, we have a place for you to put your credit card information. We promise we will not sell this to anyone other than... No, we will not sell this. You can use your credit card. You can also use your credit card to send a contribution monthly. You can do that. Or if you'd like for us to bill you, we can do that. If you'd like to join our Leadership Giving Society, anyone donating more than $500 becomes a part of this. 500 or 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. You can uh, spread this out over a period of time. You can do that. Tell us how, whether it's quarterly, semi-annually, annually. However you want to do this. So, can we? May we? Are we? Good. Remember that every dollar you give is tripled in terms of HUD grants and other grants. So consider that. Thank you for coming and joining, celebrating this with us. I, boy, we're right on schedule, too. Even heard me talking to speak. Tom, you have 15 more minutes. We do. Are there one, anyone else? Any other announcements? All right, then, speaking on behalf of Turning Point Foundation, thank you for what you're doing right now. Thank you for what you're planning to do in the future. TV.com with Tom Roberts, a speaker today at the Turning Point Foundation. How are you today? I'm doing very well. So in your speech this morning, I mean, you shared about your lifelong struggle with mental illness and how that impacted you from a long time. So why is it that it, Turning Point's important and why come up here today to share your story? I think the main thing is that I wanted to share my story for those with a mental illness that there's nothing to be ashamed of and to continue their work in getting help and support. And for those who don't know anything about mental illness, their families, for example, so much depends on how the family receives the information and can go from there to provide the adequate family support that's needed. 
That's great. Um, you talked about Bill Clinton and after one of his staff members committed suicide, and, and share that quote with us today. Yes, Bill Clinton said after Vince Foster's suicide, Vince was his deputy White House counsel, but also someone he had known since he was six years old. And Bill didn't know very much. I call him Bill because I'm from Arkansas. Okay. <laughs> he really didn't know that much about mental illness, but once he did, he said, there's nothing to be ashamed of with mental illness, but bias and stigma should shame us all. I, I agree with you 100%. So what is the most important thing for someone to understand that isn't suffering from a mental illness and how they could perhaps get involved? I think the most important thing that they need to understand is that community-based, uh, loving, accepting, uh, they tell their friends and family, hey, we're not talking about a character defect, this is a brain disease. And they need to be able to work in that regard and even go to the media. The media has a tendency to blow up things without uh, you know, giving, giving adequate explanation. Well, this person has a disease, they were not taking their medication, and that's what happened. Thank you so much for sharing your story today. If you're interested in helping the mental health here in Ventura County, reach out to Turning Point Foundation and Tom Roberts. Thanks so much for being okay. here today.